week of Victologists. My name is Lovis and today I am welcoming a very special guest to the channel, a very good friend of mine. This is Sally Snow. Hi Sally. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, Sally is a zoologist and a filmmaker who uses her skills with uh, film and photography um, to uses it for science communication and um, she's got a passion for conservation filmmaking and um, delivering stories that connect both people and the environment. And yes, I did lift that completely off of the La Mave website. She's worked with the BBC and National Geographic as well as other, many other organizations, well-known organizations. But we actually met in the Philippines when my partner and I were there working on whale shark research project with uh, the Large Marine Vertebrates Research Institute Philippines, or for short, La Mave. And Sally is one of the executive directors correct that's your that's your yes I am now I'm getting I'm getting old yeah <laughs> well she was in charge of so many things but what I remember most is that she's always there with her camera taking beautiful photos and footage of wildlife and people who work with it live with it need it um, so she was kind of in charge of marketing and and media and you've had quite a lot of success with all of your filmmaking uh, getting awards and recognition all over the place. Uh, last year you had you received the Rising Star Award from Jackson Wild. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was uh, that was really amazing. If uh, for those of you that don't know Jackson Wild, it's an amazing film festival that specializes in impact. So they're really in the, they're really keen about the environment and also what filmmaking can do to actually impact um, in terms of conservation, environmental issues. Um, and yeah, it was super honored to receive the award. It was a new award and it was about just getting different voices really because um, I think with a lot of things, sometimes we see people who've been in the game for a really long time and obviously they're amazing and they have such a great perspective. But th this award was also to try and bring uh, younger voices or newer voices. So I was, that was really amazing. Um, and yeah, they're just about to do the new one actually coming up. They're going to be doing oh, really? a Oh really? Is one. it now? Ooh. It's happening at the end of the month. So yeah, anybody interested in that, you can go and check out Jackson Wild. And what was the project that you did that earned you that award? Or was it kind of well, on, on your portfolio of work? Yeah, it was kind of weird because it wasn't for like a set film or anything. It was more just kind of as, which sounds a bit, a bit weird kind of for me, but I guess kind of like the type of work I do. Um, so I think one of the things the film festival is really amazing at is bringing together um, NGO and conservation with uh, fantastic filmmakers. So I started uh, a career in production, so doing natural history films in the UK, but then I left and came to the Philippines and I started working in conservation work and with a non-government organization. And then I started merging the two. So I think for them, it was kind of an interesting mix. And I guess part of the industry that they're trying to bring in more. Um, so yeah, so it was a bit, it was kind of, yeah, it was very overwhelming and I felt very honored because they're an amazing, um, they're an amazing network and group of people. So yeah, it was, yeah, it was very, very much a privilege. Do you want to talk a little bit about Lamave and the kind of work that Lamave does in the Philippines? Yeah, so basically, um, as Lovis mentioned, she was with us for our whale shark project. So Lamave actually, we specialize in marine megafauna and we look at the animal itself but we also work alongside communities and governments so it's a lot about finding out the ecology or behavioral critical habitats for these animals and then also some of the threats they face so some of our projects at the moment is a rapid bycatch assessment for example to understand bycatch as a threat for turtles and sharks and rays um, but also we look at tourism because obviously it's an amazing place for us to connect with animals but if it's done in an irresponsible way it can actually be really damaging because tourism often develops around critical habitats for these animals. So again, you know, if you're going to go in where an animal is feeding or resting or even reproducing, then, you know, it's, it's fundamental that you don't have a detrimental effect on that animal. Um, and yeah, we're, uh, our team has grown. So we have a lot of amazing local experts coming through at the moment who are studying whale sharks, manta rays, turtles, but we also work with loads of volunteers who are amazing because they come from all around the world. And I think, you know, having done work with Lamavi for eight years, it's really amazing. Like all the people that we've met and I've, you know, um, like with Lovis, like you have that connection because you get to work in kind of incredible environments with amazing species and with amazing communities. 
um, and a lot of my work within that then is um, communicating the research. So that could be like showing what's going on visually with photographs, but we also use film as a way of kind of connecting communities and governments. So I found that it works really well of bringing people together to work on something, which may be when it's something like a policy, which is not as exciting everyone wants to do every day, but when you kind of put it into a film that it's meant to be informative as well, um, it can actually be a really amazing platform to, to amplify that work. For sure. And um, what do you think it is about storytelling through conservation filmmaking that could inspire kind of behavioral change? Because if you're, if you're, trying, to, you're trying to create that emotional connection with the viewer, right, to make them think and to make them uh, potentially rethink some of their behavior, some of their actions. Um, what is it about conservation filmmaking that, that can do that? I think for, for me personally, I think there's two levels. So the one is actually the participation of the people in the film. So it depends what audience you're going for, right? So for example, we did, um, we did a film recently that was actually a briefing film about the do's and don'ts of swimming with turtles. So this is something that maybe is quite educational, but we realize there's two different audience because obviously there's the, the people on the ground that actually um, you know, are responsible for these guidelines. So the tour guides that take people out and they're, they're responsible for upholding them. But also the tourists, right? They need to, the tourists is the main audience because they need to know the guidelines. They need to understand the impact of breaking those guidelines, not just to the animal, but to, uh, to the people. Um, so one of the things we found worked really well was the participation of a lot of community members in the film, which was really fun because, you know, I think that was a really amazing way of actually hearing from them some of the challenges they face in communicating to tourists. So some of the things that maybe the do's and don'ts actually expanded a bit because they pointed out some really relevant things that I had no idea about because obviously I wasn't, you know, taking people out as a guide every day. Um, but we also used a local story to try and connect people to the people of the island. Um, because it's one thing saying, please don't do this because you might, you know, displace the turtle from this amazing habitat. But also, please don't do this because if the turtle disappears, you know, tomorrow, the island will lose a livelihood. So to make that kind of emotional connection, not just to the animal, but the people, we kind of told the journey of the people going to the island. So the island that we were set, uh, working at was called Apo Island and Apo in the local dialect in Bisaya actually means grandson and it got this name because supposedly a grandfather used to visit the island and he he left his newly married son on the island and they had a child they had a small son but the grandfather returned to live on the mainland so when he was on the mainland you know the neighbors would go like you know where are you going and, they, and you know he would say Dito Apo, so there to see my grandson. Wow. So the island became known as Apple Island, which is kind of grandson island. So I didn't even know foreigner. that. I missed out on this local lore while I was there. <laughs> well, it's such an amazing story, and I think a lot of people didn't know. And it's only because I spent time talking to a lot of the elders in the village, really, and being like, you know. So there was another story about the island as well, but this one I felt was a really nice one to connect because everybody can connect to family. Um, and then with the turtle, we kind of tried to get a bit more emotion about that, about telling the journey of the turtle's life and the fact that, you know, as a young turtle, they leave these nesting beaches from another di a different place. They spend years at sea. They have to fight all these perils, whether that's a fishing net or a predator, you know, from above and below, because, you know, there's the birds getting the little turtles, but there's also, you know, fish, sharks and what have you taking them inside the water. Um, and the perils and then the fact that they get to this beautiful island and they, they just need to rest in the corals, you know, they need to get a good meal eating the algae um, or for the hawks, bills, you know, getting the sponges. So we tried to portray to people, you know, that this, they haven't just like been here the whole time. They've really actually had to slog it to get here. So it's important we don't stop them for the next stage of their journey, which for the females would be returning to those nests in other places. And for the males, we don't really know, to be honest. We know that the turtles move around a lot. But at the moment, some of our work in terms of the research is actually wondering where these adults are actually going after these foraging areas. Right. Have you, what kind of feedback have you gotten from those films? Because you show them on the island as well as kind of you work with 
government and policy partners to get to get them shown elsewhere where tourists yes. will see them right yeah so it's amazing so the the park is the island is actually a protected area so it's governed by the government so the film needed to be done in collaboration with the government governing board as well as the local community so i think both working with both sides was great because you kind of got buy-in for the same um the same regulations and we actually from the feedback from the community and from the information from the research with the governing body we helped um, improve the regulations of the island so the actual law the policy for the guidelines which was a really great success uh, for us because it kind of fast tracks you know what the research is showing and we got great insight from the community and i think sometimes when you're playing in the middle you're just the messenger if that makes sense so you're kind of like you know the ideas actually come from you know Koya John John or something and he's told you something that because of the position I'm in with a with a project I'm able to to talk about that then with the governing board um, but also the island uh, now has the film so every single tourist going there will watch this film with COVID that took a little bit of a backseat because obviously sure. we weren't allowed any tourists but we're hoping that you know, next time when it's open, it's going to be, um, we're going to get to see that in action with people watching the video. Um, but we also show, so we do trainings in other sites in the Philippines that have a similar tourism setup with turtles. And, you know, when we've shown them these types of videos, if they're starting out a tourism initiative or want some ideas. And for me personally, I think that's where we get like the, the it's the, one of the best feedback because they get really excited seeing somebody like themselves on screen, which is one of the problems I think we have kind of globally, especially because the, a lot of films we see are made by the West. Mm. It means that I don't think globally we have a, a decent representation, right? And the storytelling of all these different people around the world. Um, you know, I've, I worked in the UK for a long time in production and often we're telling stories about these faraway places, but it's not necessarily through the eyes of the local person or the person that knows you know that area so well so okay. just seeing you know representation of yourself you know you see that everyone's like yes they're like yes that's the guide that I want to be <laughs> and you know I get so excited by that because it's just like I just love working with people so it's really rewarding you actually kind of preempted my next question um I was I was going to point out that I mean, on the channel, I'm talking about eco fiction, right? And I'm, I'm talking to you and you're telling true stories. Most of, most of the stories that you're telling are, are people's lives and people's memories and their um, family history. And you're putting them on film and using them um, to tell conservation stories. Um, but what you were saying about um, representation, I was going to ask if there were stories that were not being told that should get more attention um, and whether storytelling in whatever form, film, photography, or uh, fiction, could, um, could help tell those stories to give people different perspectives on, an, on a situation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, and it's a very topical subject at the moment within the kind of wildlife or environmental filmmaking industry about exactly that, right? About the representation that gets across. Because part of that is also the people who are telling the stories. And obviously I'm a Westerner, right, in the Philippines. So it's kind of the irony there. But the point is, is you, there also needs to be an effort to give um, a, a platform for people within the country being able to tell their stories. And for example, here in the Philippines, we have an amazing um, magazine. It's actually a travel magazine and they do a lot of different content from, you know, photojournalism kind of stories to small shorts. And um, that is just full of amazing Filipino talent. And for me, it's really inspiring because, you know, they say, you know, they tell stories about a lot about the cultural um, elements of certain thrives or certain traditions here or foods, um, but they also go more into the environment. And that's really amazing to see. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something I know that just going back to Jackson Wild, which I mentioned earlier, but I know that's something as well that the industry really wants to talk about. And it's like, why, you know, especially maybe in the UK, why are we not seeing so many stories told from a different perspective? And obviously a lot of that is because our, the industry, especially for filmmaking is largely within the UK. We're really lucky that we've got a really great natural history, wildlife, environmental um, departments and industry. 
but um but you know to get those global voices as well it, it's a case of you know actually maybe commissioning something from somebody in a different country um so yeah but i think you know but there's still there is some amazing stuff and there's actually a film that i saw recently it's a short film called flying elephants and okay. it's it's narrated by Beta Kuruba tribe. So sorry, it's the narration is in the tribal language of the Beta Kuruba. Um, and it's just an amazing story. And it's kind of, it's a story about elephants having wings because of, and it's about what they lost from the land. And it's kind of like some punishment that they were no, I mean, yeah, it's, but it's a, it's an amazing, I don't want to say too much because I think it's nicer to watch the film in itself, but it's a beautiful film. And, you know, I think it has a really different perspective. And for me, like, you know, hearing it narrated in the local, you know, the tribal language and then, yeah, yeah, just the story, which is obviously an ancestral story that will have been passed down. Um, so it's really beautiful. And I'll put a link to that in the description below. I'm sure Sally will provide me with that link. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That would be great. Um, do you think, do you think there's space for, for fiction to tell those stories as well? Um, to represent the true stories, but in kind of a different context, maybe to access a different audience? Yeah, for sure. And I was thinking about this because, um, you know, I think fiction can take us on such wonderful journeys. And I think one of the things now, like there's some fantastic um, documentaries at the moment that are to do with environmental issues, conservation issues, which are almost like blockbusters. Like one of my favorite films ever, which is, which is still fiction, is the Ivory Games, which is about elephants and ivory. But the film is literally like some kind of Hollywood blockbuster because of the narrative, the way it's shot, like everything. The first time I saw it, I was like, oh my goodness, I feel like we're at the movies, but this is real life. <laughs> which obviously we still talk about fiction, but I think the thing there is you can, these kind of topics are really incredible topics and stories. So I think bringing in, and if you're weaving in fiction, I think the, the thing you have to be careful of is that boundary of making something, you know, the element of truth, whether you're, what you're talking, the say you're talking about conservation issue, it's important that that is factually correct. Mm -hmm. But then the story around it obviously could, not be right? right so i think because sometimes i think there's a relationship where people are like well that wasn't 100 percent true or they mm. end up thinking that might be 100 percent true when there's an add-on maybe right yeah um but the, there's some great things and if you think about it we've had some fantastic stories come out about like pandemics or you, you know which are also huge implications for humankind right as conservation and climate change is right so I think we should, it would be amazing to see more ecofiction around those types of issues. Like imagine a fantastic film about climate change, but that had a positive outcome because I think that is incredible. Imagine important. that. <laughs> imagine that. And then we could maybe try and make that story come true, you know? I guess that's, that's one of the issues, isn't it? Or not issues, but difficulties. If, you, if you're going to take a topic like conservation or climate change or um, habitat destruction and... Um, and you, you want to get across the, the facts and the science and also how, um, how serious the situation is, but you don't want it to be a complete downer. <laughs> yeah. you want, and, and you, I think the difficulty is finding an ending for those stories that is positive, but doesn't make it seem like, oh, it can be easily solved or trivial. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't make it trivial. Like if you're a lot of, um, books looking to the future um will say oh and then we invented this technology um that saved us or that that yeah. completely turned the tide yeah. and it's not necessarily untrue it might happen but it when you read that it almost like negates yeah the, I know what you mean the seriousness of the situation how do you think people how do you think fiction writers or, or storytellers in general can can kind of I don't, I don't know I mean it is really tricky and because they're such serious issues, right? And I think there needs to be so much awareness within the public. Um, also, I guess anybody that studies, you know, conservation or any of these kind of issues, you, you're fearful as well that you don't want people to, like you said, feel blasé that the situation is not serious or it's going to be a quick, easy fix. Um, 
But I don't know. I mean, maybe one way around it would be looking at it from the future, looking back. So I don't know, like if you had a grandmother who was talking to her children and was saying like, well, you wouldn't believe what your forefathers went through, right? And then, do, and I guess reflecting on maybe the challenges of, of the times and then, I'd, but I guess you still need to know, right? Like how did they sort it out? Which again is the, is the big like, what, yeah. you, what made you still alive, grandma? Um, <laughs> So, I suppose um, I suppose that's one thing fiction could do is to explore the different possibilities and kind of like follow follow the possibilities down down their their perspective cascade and domino effects to see where it where it all ends up. Um, but even just other, to rep sorry, go ahead. No, go. Ah, uh, sorry. I was just going to say the other thing as well would be to kind of focus on a smaller part of the story. Um, so maybe following, I don't know, some climate activist and the ups and downs of that, but maybe the, you know, the, a positive narrative so that by the end there is a positive uh, step forward, but maybe it's not the end of climate change, but maybe it's, I don't know, the commitments of governments to finally cut the, cut the source of fossil fuels or whatever it is, I think. But something tangible like that, mm -hmm. I think would make people go like, oh, actually, yeah now I think maybe I'll go out and vote because I do want to put a stop to fossil fuels. Yes, and maybe this is something goals. I can do in my lifetime, right? Yeah. Exactly. Because yeah. I think it's really important that we can actually identify with, you know, such complex and anxiety issues, right? I mean, For it's sure. not easy thinking about all these things. As a conservationist, I mean, I definitely feel the ups and downs of being like oh my god okay we're moving forward and then it's like despair <laughs> and I think it's all about trying to you know make sure that you get those positive things in your life and there are, they are there and there are tangible things that each of us can do but knowing that and I think being motivated by a story to actually you know embody that would be is crucial right and I've talked on the channel before about eco-anxiety and um kind of depression about about the state of the world and climate change and um and how that can that that's becoming and is already a, a very real problem and a, a very real mental state that people are, are anxious about the survival of um our way of life basically um and in in other in other cases of mental health, people look for representation in, in fiction and in the media that we consume in general, in films as well. Um, so it, I think fiction can, can give, it, it's, it's another tool that people can use to kind of deal with this, with these feelings of, of eco-anxiety. And if you can represent kind of one small storyline, like you were saying, with a positive outcome, and potentially can hold the hold the panic at, at bay if you think yeah there are small things that I can do tangible things that I can achieve um, that could be a really positive a really positive way to read ecofiction I think yeah for sure I mean I think um, yeah like you said narratives that you can connect with right about anything and can give you a positive outcome it is just amazing I mean, you get yourself lost in a book, you can identify with a character, might be going through something similar to you, um, whatever that may be, right? Whether it's mental health or climate anxiety, anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's the power of the story, I guess, isn't it? Whether that's a book you get lost in, a film that you watch. Um, there's definitely, I know, you know, for me and other people, there's definitely films where you watch and you're like, oh my goodness, that's kind of had an impact in my life that it kind of pushed me to go one way or the other. Um, and the same with books, you know, it's so inspiring. Yeah. And this play between hope and despair, like you were saying, I mean, I completely understand it's day to day. You have to really be careful where you, you give your attention because it can, it can just overwhelm you sometimes. Um, but have you noticed that people respond better to the, stories about hope and success stories and and progress and conservation rather than the the stories that are talking just about the destruction and kind of the what we're losing yeah for sure i mean i personally i'm a huge 
believer in kind of like solution driven storytelling and like positive um, outcomes. My partner actually is the opposite. He's like, you know, you give him some kind of death and desperation. He's like, oh my goodness, I'm so motivated. I'm going to get out of there and save the world. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it's over. <laughs> so I think it really, it really depends on the person. But generally, I mean, what from what I've observed, and and also you'll see this within uh, kind of like the filmmaking industry, right? Films that only focus on the despair don't do very well because ultimately a lot of people just don't want to see that and they'll want to turn off. So especially for like broadcast channels, they're not going to commission those types of films because they know that the audience doesn't really want that. Um, and I think that's kind of even more so now because we're so bombarded with what's going on. And I think COVID has added an extra layer of anxiety as well, right? Whereby you need something positive because there is, there's so much kind of crazy things going down. So, I mean, the, yes, there might be some people who are like, okay, it's got so bad. No, I'm going to take action, you know? But I think there's a lot of people who are like, oh my goodness, I can't handle this. You know, I just want to go and watch like puppies on YouTube. Which again, but I mean, but instead of watching puppies on YouTube, why don't you watch something like really wonderful to do with, I don't know, you know, the environment or anything about, you know, eco fiction, whether it's, or it could be documentary. Um, but yeah, definitely. I definitely believe in, in positivity because I think, um, and, and that's what you see often, the types of films that come out, they don't tend to just focus on the bad. It is, however, very important to express some of those bad things and kind of highlight sure. the seriousness and the urgency of things. But I think there always needs to be a silver lining. And, you know, one of the things that, especially when you make films now, I think it's really important that you have a call to action for people because there needs to be something that people can do. And that could be one thing, or it could be, it could be one tiny thing, like, you know, start taking your bike to work, stop using your car, like every day of the week, right? Just do one cycle day a week. Or it could be a call to action that would be like, stop using electricity. Obviously, that's a very hard one. But what I mean to show, right, is just it needs to be something tangible that people can do. Um, and sometimes people can do big things, sometimes they, but most of the time we can do small things first. For sure. And the, the words call to action just uh, reminded me of something else that um, you have done is that you've received funding from the Conservation Media Group, which describes himself as, as encouraging filmmakers for call to action campaigns, correct? Yeah, so they're awesome, CMG. And uh, they specialize, so their specialist is like impact media. So they want uh, media that produces, that has an impact. So actually the, the briefing video that we did on Apple Island, that was actually funded by them. Um, and they've, they've really helped me grow actually because they ask those questions about like, you know, what, what is your call to action? Like, really, who is the audience? What, how are we going to know that this film actually made a difference? Um, so you need some kind of indicators or metrics. So with mm. the Apple Island film, for example, our primary audience was the tourists, but the secondary audience was like the tour guide. So it's kind of to improve the implementation of the, the rules. And um, because we are a research institute, we've actually done compliance surveys and seen how tourists behave to the guidelines when there was no briefing video in place. And then we're hoping after COVID that we'll be able to do that and actually look at the difference. Um, but also things like another indicator for us was actually improving policy with the governing board. Um, and that came about through the production of the video and the inclusion of people. Um, so there's, there's different types of things. But I think the thing that's really amazing about it, and this goes for anybody who's maybe trying to do, even if it's a multimedia piece, if you want to make a difference and have somebody do something, you need to be very specific about what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so with us, it was like, follow the guidelines, like do not abuse <laughs> these guidelines <laughs> that are there to protect the turtle. Um, but you need that. And then you need to kind of be able to show that it's actually made an impact, um, which is something that more and more films are actually starting to do now. They're rolling out an impact campaign, especially these big documentaries. So a really amazing documentary that came out last year was Sea of Shadows, which was about the Bakita. So this is the rarest cetacean in the world. There's almost none left. Um, they're found in Mexico. And the documentary tells the story of this animal, but from the perspectives of many different people, from scientists, from fishing communities, from 
investigative journalists in the country and also it kind of goes into corruption and drug industry and all kinds of amazing things that you need to watch the film for but one of the things that this film did incredibly well is that they had an impact campaign that went alongside the film so that concentrated it on showing the film to the right audience so not just to the global audience but actually like in those fishing communities and having you know open forums for them to discuss the problems going into you know high-end officials in the government and actually showing them the film which had some quite compromising footage of government officials and some of the things going on so it kind of forced their hand as well um one of the characters is a is a Mexican investigative journalist who is incredible and he played a huge role as well in kind of making a difference about you know getting legislation or one of the problems was this drug trade which is explained in the film um you know what impact that was having also on the communities um so they they did a fantastic job and they're kind of really changing the game for a lot of these big films that do tackle environmental issues because we can't just talk about them anymore we have to do something um, so that's great to see that that's happening. Wow, I'm definitely adding that to my list of list of documentaries to watch. That sounds it's a great. Good one. And I think this kind of brings me to my next question, which is, I sometimes find if when I talk about conservation work that there is a bit of a miscommunication or a misunderstanding of peop of what conservation work actually is so in that in that um example you were just giving the conservation of the vaquita was not just between was not just scientist led it it it, it also includes uh politicians and um it it includes issues like corruption and drug trafficking and you have to work with the locals and you have to work with all kinds of different bodies it's not it's never a straightforward one solution kind of situation and i and i kind of feel like people don't really understand that so much the how difficult conservation work can actually be and my question was can conservation storytelling and um potentially also in in fiction kind of bring that across kind of help with the science communication of conservation work yeah i think absolutely and like you said conservation is kind of this weird word everyone's like oh yeah i'm into conservation but it's like what what does that mean you know or like i support conservation but um i think for me conservation includes everyone because if we want to protect or conserve a species ultimately it comes down to humans so that is humans in all capacities and we are such a dominating species and we have woven our way into all these complex ecosystems that you know each one of us has an impact in conservation just because of the way that we've developed technology everything but in terms of storytelling for sure i think one of the things that we're seeing more of and i think we need to see even more of is that multi um multi-perspective approach because just hearing about like what the researchers say is incredibly valuable and is fundamental for the conservation of a species say but actually understanding the barriers for protecting that species for a local community is really important because you can't, even if the research says, you know, say the research says, this is an incredibly important bay for whale sharks, we must protect it. You can say like, oh, okay, what we've got to do, right, is protect this area and then the whale sharks are fine. But that's not really the case because then the research will tell you that the whale sharks move around and there's multiple places they need protecting. But ultimately, all of these places that need protecting will have human presence and understanding the needs and the use of that area for humans and what would be the conflicts you might face so if it's an incredibly important fishing ground for the local community who have no other source of income or other possibilities for a different type of work or it is such a traditional job that's been handed down for generations you need to understand those barriers because there will be a way of working with those communities but if we don't even hear their perspective, then how can we even begin to make progress, right? And the same with the government. Governments obviously can do amazing things, but they also have so many things to juggle. They'll be concerned that I can't put a whole village out of a livelihood. Like, what are they gonna do? We don't have another livelihood for them to do. I'm not sure I wanna protect this bay and stop all the fishing inside it, right? 
or maybe they're going to be like yes we really want to do this because we need to improve our environmental outputs for this year also have some kind of you know pay back when things go sour because people are starving because they don't have any food so seeing all these different perspectives is so important the same if tourists are visiting those areas and actually doing something damaging like you know leaving loads of litter maybe they keep going and jumping on the whale shark because they're going out with a, out a tour guide or whatever it could be right that means that they need educating and they need controlling as well in the sense that we need to kind of come up with some sort of system that the, those animals are not compromised. So it's, it's so important. And I think traditionally, maybe some of the programs we've seen before, particularly thinking old, back in the olden days, I guess more, <laughs> is you would see a traditional scientist or something and you would see the animal, but it might not include so many voices of the local people. Yeah. So I think Sea of Shadows, for example, is a fantastic documentary that really does that. Um, and I think as well, as the world or the filmmaking industry, especially in the West, is starting to realize how important these global voices are. I think they're trying, you know, obviously people are moving in a way to get more of those voices in. And I think we'll all understand things better then. Um, because sometimes we may want to save the elephant in, you know, I might be in Scotland or France and I want to save the elephant. I don't have elephants on my backyard. Yeah. So I don't really understand what saving the elephant would actually mean to a person who does have an elephant in their backyard. So I think learning about that is also really important. For sure. And I think um, understanding the perspectives of the people who use the same environments as these animals that we're trying to protect, it's easy from, from the outside to, to kind of place blame or to, to say that's bad or that's wrong and they shouldn't do that. But if, they have no other choice than to take advantage of that resource or, or if um, take the elephants. I mean, there's a huge human wildlife conflict with elephants destroying croplands or, yeah, for example. Um, and so they have to, you know, the farmers, that's their livelihood. They have to protect yeah. their crops. And if you don't tell the story from that perspective, then people on the outside are placing blame in the wrong, the wrong place. <laughs> and yeah, then it absolutely. just adds to the miscommunication. And there's so, so many of the issues are so complex. I think the other thing we see now, right, like our mobile phones, right? We all have smartphones. So like so much of the world has smartphones, but smartphones use loads of different um, elements, right? To make up the complexity of them. And a lot of those things come from mines all over the world, which have environmental damage often, or, you know, sometimes some form of controvert, well, nearly always there's some form of controversy with mining. And, you know, if a mine is actually polluting the water of a local village that maybe once was not going into the forest where they have an endangered right. species, um, right, maybe that was fine. But now that they don't have any water and now they're having to go into the, the forest, maybe they end up displacing these animals, you know, not intentionally, but because they've been pushed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you think about something like that, that actually comes from you as part of the, part of the issue, right? Because you're the one that's on the smartphone. And maybe you didn't realize that when you bought this, you also bought into this chain. I mean, I'm not trying to depress everyone, but like it is very, very complex. And I think that's why the more, you know, information we can get, but also I think one of the things for me that's really positive, hopefully with COVID, I'm hoping that a sense of sustainability will get ingrained in a lot of businesses because I really think if you want to be, so as a consumer, you should support businesses that support sustainability, B corporations, businesses that give back to the environment, businesses that don't you know, take from the environment because so many things take from the environment without actually paying the price. And whoever pays the price is somebody that we don't see or it is us through things like climate change. So you know, that's one of the most powerful things I think people can do is um, support sustainable businesses and, and call them up. You know, as a power of a consumer, you can do that. Um, I actually only have one question left for you, um, and that is to ask you whether you've read any fiction that you want to recommend um, Ooh, okay. that made you feel wonder or awe about the natural environment or that portrayed a, a conservation issue really well or um, told from a perspective you didn't expect or, or anything really. So yes i i do i i love to read um i tend to read actually a lot of fiction 
that is not to do with the environment, but I was thinking about it. Maybe that's because this genre is not as popular. I think a lot of the times it's about people, uh, relationships and the and complexities of that. But one of the books I did read recently, which is a classic, is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which actually was really, really interesting because obviously there is uh, factual content within here, but it obviously it's a fictional book, right? Because it, it's from like, I think it's the 1700s, and then they're in a submarine that, you know, is under the, under the sea. I won't go tell you too much about it because I don't want to spoil it, but it is an amazing book. And while the relationship the people involved, the relationship they have with the sea is kind of quite exploitative in the sense that they tend to be like battling uh, a lot of sea creatures, which, <laughs> which I'm not so keen on. But the way they describe the ocean is very different to how you would describe it now. They still talk about animals that we have now, but they talk about it in the sense that there is so much more. And I wonder if that's because, you know, when the author wrote this book, that was the case, right? There was many more animals in the sea than there is now or whether that was just fanta fan fantasy, right? And he wanted to like, you know, really amp up what was in the ocean. But I actually think it's because there was more animals in the sea. I think, you know, the reports then from what naturalists were finding would have been, you know, much more significant than what we're seeing now. Um, mm -hmm. because, because we have lost things. I mean, the Stella sea cow is a good example of an animal that was discovered and then disappeared in like a tiny amount of time, like decades. So, you know, if he wrote the book when they were around, you know, we'd be like, well, we didn't even see them in our generation. Yeah. Um, so that was a good one. Another one that I was thinking of, because I was trying to think of eco-fiction books that I'd read. And I was struggling because I've read some really good non-fiction. Um, yeah. Recently, I, I read a lovely little book that is a lot of stories. Um, it's called She Explores. And it's loads of different stories of women in the wilderness. Ooh. or connection with nature so they're very short stories it's really nice um i think most i think nearly all the women is actually in the u.s but it's, it's just a fantastic way of talking about people's connection to the environment whether that's through music or camping or i don't know taking people um who are less able into the wilderness like just that was really inspiring um and another book that when i was trying to think about eco fiction that i read recently was the galapagos by Kurt Von Echt. I don't know if you've ever read this. No. But it is a really bizarre book. <laughs> so it's actually to do, it's about, it talks about the merit of the human brain from the evolutionary perspective. So basically, I don't want to tell you what the whole book is, but basically some disaster happens and this group of people get stranded on one of the islands of the Galapagos. And while they are there, the rest of humankind becomes infertile and basically disappears off the face of the earth. Ooh. So they become the only survivors of the race, right? And then it talks about basically where they evolved to over this time. And it's Ooh. very, it's, kind, it's really weird because I guess it's kind of like if we all disappeared and then we carried on, what version of us would survive, right? And his work as well as a writer is um i've read a few of his books i'm trying to remember which one i which of the other ones i read but they are really quite particular the way that he writes and they're quite bizarre i think some people will be like i don't get this but if you do it is a really like weird and kind of interesting book and obviously it does the hints of that is that it kind of is a nod to charles darwin right who obviously spent a lot of time in the galapagos and obviously with his um talking about you know, natural selection yeah and evolution so so yeah so it is an interesting one cool well I, I will be adding that to my to be read list because I'm intrigued now it sounds weird but I'm intrigued <laughs> it is it is a good one his his books are yeah I don't know if you would really classify it as ecofiction but I do think there is an element of relevance there um, Brilliant. Well, I mean, ecofiction, you know, what I, what, if, if I make a connection to ecofiction with one book, it doesn't mean that the next person will have the same connection. So if you've found a connection to the environment in that book, that makes it ecofiction. That's the beauty of the boundaryless category. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right. Well, that, that about wraps us up, Sally. So, um, 
I will be leaving, I will be asking you for all of the links of the different things that you mentioned and I will be leaving them all in the description below so everybody can find them. I will be leaving the link to La Mave website as well in the description below and um, if anybody has any questions for Sally then um, you can let me know and I will pass them along and hopefully Sally will get back to me and I will feed all the feed all the answers back to you. But um, I guess all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for for taking the time to, to do this interview and um, agreeing to be on the channel. I really, I really enjoyed talking to you about this. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's been great. Um, so that's all for today and I will see you next week, Ecofictologist.